Anytime a bunch of innocent people die at once, it is terrifying. Mass shootings are especially so because it could have been us or it could have been our children. And we all go to grocery stores, we go to the movies, we all go to church, and we all go to school. The right says it is because of the mentally ill. And let me tell you, I know plenty of people who have diagnosable mental illnesses and they are not shooting up schools and grocery stores. As far as I know, mental illness is everywhere and in every country, but our country is the one with the mass shooting problem. People who have mental illnesses cannot be our scapegoats. The right says that there is this entity of evil out there that, and there's nothing you can do about it. People who want to kill people will kill people. And maybe there is some truth to that. However, we can legislate against violence and build systems that promote justice and public safety. This is what the entire history of law and law enforcement has attempted to do. We can limit violence with good, sensible laws. The right argues that we just need more armed guards and police. Well, in Buffalo, the shooter outgunned an armed security guard with 30 years of police experience. The guard's bullets clinked off the avowed racist body armor. The guard was then gunned down. The Uvalde School District had its own police force, but it didn't quite work. Banning body armor and assault and military style weapons and having robust background checks would make a huge difference. How do we know? The proof is in other countries, New Zealand, Australia, much of Europe, and soon to be Canada, which have strictly regulated guns. And guess what? Gun violence has slowed to a trickle. And there's proof in our very own country. From 1994 to 2004, when there was a ban on assault weapons and high capacity magazines, death tolls were also reduced. And isn't it just too bad? The American way of doing democracy, the inefficiency of it, the clunkiness slower than a bad internet connection. A majority of Americans support universal background checks, keeping people with serious mental illness issues from buying guns, bans on assault style weapons and high capacity magazines and red flag laws. But isn't it also just too bad and unfortunate that we have this awkward and mumbled collection of words called the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state and the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Is that an individual right? Very debatable. Linguists agree that when the Second Amendment was written, the most common meaning of the phrase to bear arms was collective military activity. The Second Amendment has nothing to do with defending your property, self-defense, or individual rights. Now, I have no doubt that the writers of the amendment and the culture that ultimately ratified them liked their muskets and they owned lots of muskets probably. Guns can and should be permitted, but come on. If you take this originalist argument of getting what, what the writers were intending, they had no idea of the weapons of mass destruction that would eventually be invented. The Second Amendment was a cr created to appease the states that were unwilling to ratify the Constitution. Anti-federalists wanted more power to be held by states. So since the Constitution clearly already stated that the federal government can have an army, 
They feared the power of a federal army and wanted explicit assurance that states could have militias. And it was not by coincidence that militias also happened to be great at squashing slave rebellions and killing indigenous people. There are no longer state militias. The closest thing we have is the National Guard. And we have a different system of professional armed forces and police than we did over 200 years ago. So the Second Amendment is an arcane jumble of words and commas irrelevant to our time. At its best, the Second Amendment is ambiguous on an individual's right to own guns. And for the first 200 years, all Supreme Court rulings regarding the Second Amendment had to do with either militias or that the government does in fact have the right to regulate guns. And thus, Congress created plenty of gun laws. But things have changed in the past few decades. Gun manufacturers and lobbyists led by the NRA looked to reinterpret the Second Amendment. It took decades and millions of dollars to create law research institutes, getting their candidates elected and judges appointed. And not that long ago, in 2008, Justice Antonin Scalia wrote the Heller majority opinion in which he said, the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes. This was a radical departure from the original intent of the Second Amendment. And for liberal leaning scholars like Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Second Amendment simply states the right for states' rights to have militias and ordinary people to join them and to have guns in their possessions at their homes for this military service. So let's change the narrative. Owning a gun is not some absolute right enshrined in the Constitution. The government can, should, and does regulate guns. If we want a less violent society, guns should be highly regulated rare and not easy to get. Rifles for deer hunters, sure. Shotguns for bird hunters, okay. Handguns, all right. Permits, licenses, and mandatory safety training. This is what we do for automobiles. Guns of mass murder should be illegal to own and also body armor should be outlawed or heavily regulated and New York State is poised to do that. And by the way, let's do away with control talk. Control has a negative connotation. And let's instead use terms like public health and gun safety. Let's instead talk about how well-regulated guns will reduce gun violence and bring about more life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Laws work. A 21-year-old age limit would have made a difference in both Buffalo and Texas. You can't buy beer, but you can buy an assault rifle. And the human brain is not fully developed until at least 25 years old. Laws would not eliminate all mass shootings, but they would no doubt reduce the carnage. Now this is quite possibly a long road ahead of us. Some laws will take decades to enact. And we're gonna to have to continue this movement in the same way the NRA took a long view. It's going to involve legal scholarship and getting progressive judges appointed. So what do we do now? We vote for candidates that promote public safety and health. We pr promote a healthy and creative masculinity that doesn't need guns. We march for our lives, like next Sunday, June 11th, 
at noon in Potsdam at Ives Park. We support and partner with groups who share our values and we do our part to change the narrative on what the Second Amendment actually says. With terror, with grief, fear, and the frustratingly slow pace of our federal government, we can remain grounded in the peace of ponds. Despite all the trauma and the work and the messiness of our democratic system, we can go to the pond. Now, one of the things I, I did on my sabbatical is I read all of Mary Oliver's poetry and some of her books multiple times. So much pleasure in those words of hers. She often observes something in nature and then has some revelatory encounter with meaning along the way. Dozens of her poems, like the reading I, I shared with you, have to do with Blackwater Pond. And so I took Mary Oliver quite literally. I went to the pond, her pond, her beloved Blackwater Pond. It's near the hook tip of Cape Cod jutting out into the ocean near Provincetown. I booked a nice but cheap hotel across the street from a tidal flat just blocks from where Mary Oliver lived. A bunch of middle-aged women were sunning, sitting on the outdoor furniture in front of my hotel door, drinking wine. Because we were in Provincetown, I assumed they were lesbians. Should we move? One asked. Give me a glass of wine and you can stay as long as you, as you like, I said. What are you doing here? One asked me. I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. I am on sabbatical and I'm on a pilgrimage in search of the paths that the poet Mary Oliver walked. And so the next morning I woke at 5 a.m. as she says she does in many of her poems. And just two miles away, two miles away, a five minute drive just outside the town. And I mean just outside the town in the Cape Cod National Seashore near a nicely paved park service road, there is a large parking lot. And I mean, really large, like it could hold 80 to 90 cars. Only two cars were there when I got there, birders with their big boom lenses. I see why she came early to avoid the crowds. And I walk the mile long loop around Blackwater Pond and I read some of her poems, including th this part of one. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. And for that week, I came back each morning for more black water, soft, gentle. I didn't taste it, but in a way I did. The water was calm, it did not move, and I saw in it the trees the reflected clouds of the sky. There was a small drifting haze above it. Black water was at peace. And so was I. The sun will warm black water in time. The birds will drink black water. Black water will absorb the storms. And I drink of the peace of black water, and now it is in me. The pond was not grand, nor was it large. 
sort of a minor indent in the dunes, really. Dark from organic matter settling to the bottom. The path of the pond was a gentle one where many feet have trod. The park service keeps it up. And before that, the Commonwealth did. Immediately surrounded by a beech forest and salt, small sand hills covered in scrubby pine. Circling around the black center in the midst of a mist, I imagined I was a pilgrim at Mecca. Ducks took off, startled. They flapped their wings over and over so hard over the black water for the entire length. Mary Oliver says, how important it is to walk along, not in haste, but slowly looking at everything. Some beautiful bird, gray, small, flapping its wings. Was it a warbler? I don't know the names, but it stopped right in front of me on a branch and sang, just for me. So find your own black water to the tune of a warbler or a cardinal for black water is closer to you than you are to your own breath. Observe it every morning, that ordinary but wild place within. Now you don't have to go there at 5 a.m. But I did feel like cheating when I arrived late one day at 7.40 a.m. And these walks, they don't need special shoes or equipment. They, were, they can be done in $300 dress shoes. It's a simple, wild place. And Mary Oliver wrote, what countries, what visitations, what pomp would satisfy me as thoroughly as black water woods on a sun-filled morning or equally in the rain? Her walks were prayers, not exercises. Meditations, not destinations. Mary's invitation still stands Come to the pond, no matter your location. Come to the pond with its many parking spots. Come to the pond, access for all. Oh, and here, here's the good news. You don't have to drive to Blackwater Pond on the Cape. We have our own brown water of the grass and the raquette. It is the slow and difficult trick of living the pond and finding the pond where you are. Coming to the pond is taking the time to pay attention, taking the time to observe to be aware of the diverse mystery that is before us. So come to the pond, come to the river, come to the harbor, come to the pine woods and find the slow inner wilderness of peace. Despite the terror and the gore of violence, come to the pond. Amen and blessed be.